Inflation easing, odds of a European recession dropping, and North America coming together. Maybe just a gleam of optimism for the new year. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This week, special contributor Larry Summers on whether we're seeing a light at the end of the inflation tunnel or a false dawn. If you think about it, the good news was inflation running in the sixes. That's still inconceivably high. Former IBM CEO Sam Palmasano on CEOs facing a very different world. Do what's necessary to maintain strategic growth and drive productivity at the same time. And economist Melissa Carney of the University of Maryland on what declining births in the United States could mean for economic growth. You have fewer people of working age. More worryingly, it could mean lower GDP per capita. Maybe it was just the promise of a new year, or maybe, just maybe, things really are starting to look a little bit better. As the leaders of the three nations of North America gathered in Mexico City this week and sought cooperation on a host of issues. Above all, we both committed to pursuing a better future, one grounded on peace and prosperity for all of our people. We're at one of those inflection points where what we do in the next several years is going to determine what the world looks like for the next two, three, four decades. In Europe, odds of recession are dropping, at least according to the Belgian prime minister. If you look at the, the economic indicators, um, indeed, uh, the fear for recession is, is diminishing, um, and there are good reasons for that. And in the United States, inflation signals reinforced what we thought we saw at the end of last year. Inflation may, just may, be truly coming back down. A month-over-month -month, uh, CPI print negative. This number was bang on the screws. Inflation has clearly peaked. When he finally got the job, Speaker Kevin McCarthy got off to a surprisingly bipartisan start, with the House almost unanimous in approving a new select committee to look into threats posed by China. We know that China right now is what would be called our pacing threat. This is something not just from a military perspective, but also from an economic perspective that we've seen our vulnerabilities, particularly over the last couple of years. Though things weren't quite as smooth for all the other lawmakers as the new Republican member from Long Island, George Santos, faces a range of investigations and growing calls for him to step aside, including from Republicans. On behalf of the Nassau County Republican Committee, I am calling for his immediate resignation. We must call for the resignation of Congressman George Santos. Calling for George Santos to resign. Calling on George Santos to resign. Demand that George Santos steps down. Calling him to step aside. He should resign. My office will have no interaction with George Santos or his staff until he resigns. In the end, the markets this week saw the half-full part of the glass, with the S&P 500 gaining 2.7 percent for the week, and the Nasdaq up 4.8 percent, while bonds strengthened as well, with the yield on the 10-year down six basis points, ending at just about 3.5 percent. Take us through the week in the numbers. Welcome now, Afsani Beshla, CEO of Rock Creek, and David Bianco, DWS Group CIO for the Americas. So welcome back, both of you. It's good to have you here. David, let me start with you. CPI numbers encouraging inflation. Is that what's driving the markets right now? It is. Um, and we knew that going into the week that investors would be focused on the inflation report. There were whispers that the inflation report would surprise to the downside. It didn't. It came banging on target. Um, but it confirms that inflation is continuing to come down. However, the battle's not over. And I think investors should, and certainly the Fed, will likely stay focused on the labor market. And we still see wages really running red hot. So the inflation fight's not over. We probably have a few more hikes ahead of about 25 basis points. Oh, that's interesting. I'm signing a few more hikes ahead. The question for me is, it may not be over, but how close is it to being over? What do you think the Fed's going to think when they meet at the beginning of February? I think the Fed is uh, still trying to remain relatively hawkish, and um, and as David said, uh, pretty sure they will do that uh, 25 basis points in their next meeting. They are looking, as he said, um, at the employment numbers really carefully, and um, and also, of course, at uh, earnings reports that are coming out as we speak. So. 
So I think those uh, two items will be important. Uh, wage growth is starting to show a little bit of uh, maybe a softening. We're seeing people starting to talk about laying off in certain sectors like finance and technology. So I think all of that will factor into the next uh, conversation about rate hikes. So, so, David, we're all focused on the Fed, and we will be for some time to come. But I know you think that we also should be looking at other parts of Washington that may actually be affecting the investment criteria right now. And what, what should we be focusing on as we go into 2023? Well, well, there's a lot of things going on. So with inflation, I would argue the, the near-term focus really should be on the labor market. We do have disinflation on goods, and we've had some on commodities, but the disinflation on goods is because we are entering a goods consumption and goods production uh, recession. And I think we'll hear more about that during earnings season. So in the near term, stay focused on the labor market for where inflation goes, what the Fed needs to do about it. But longer term, yes, I agree that the longer term inflation outlook has a lot to do with policies, both at home and worldwide, but policies that relate to how well we spend, what type of return on investment we get on things like energy, energy transition, um, even defense, and so on and so forth. So, Sonny, when we hear energy, we think of you necessarily. You've had a lot of your career tied up with energy. You studied it, as I recall, at Oxford as well. Tell us about the federal policies right now in energy, how they may be affecting some investment decisions. The interesting thing is, obviously, when we talk about, um, about policymakers, we think about the uh, Inflation Act. But just before we go there, I think what's interesting is the concentration of, uh, of the market has been on what the Fed is doing. And what is interesting is President Biden and, um, and his team have been equally focused on removing some of the supply chain problems. We saw what they did with, uh, for example, the, uh, the trains um, unions. Um, we saw that, uh, for example, the energy reserves that were released and uh, and and where one of uh, that was one of the reasons that gas prices are where they are, among other reasons, of course. So government has been much more proactive uh, when it comes to different areas, but in uh, terms of its policies, but particularly when it comes to energy. And um, and I think it has quietly been quite effective in uh, keeping energy prices down. We've seen, by the way, similar things in Germany. And um, then coming back to the IRA, of course, that is huge because there's the direct uh, impact of the IRA, which is, uh, you know, over 300 billion. But there's also the leverage impact in the sense that we're seeing already a lot of private sector deals happening, uh, whether you look at big private equity firms that are doing very large projects, uh, people investing in, um, in clean energy, but also in things like LNG terminals to, uh, for, the, for the short term. And then last but not least, um, venture firms are looking at uh, uh, hydrogen projects because they're seeing again with the IRA that there is potential for some of these investments that are longer term investments. So, so David, when we talk about energy, we have I mean, two sides of the house. One is the fossil fuel side. And right. there's a question of that. The release from the SPR, the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, certainly affected that. But you also have investment decisions like Ioneer now is something like a $700 million loan from the Department of Energy tied to that investment inflation reduction act. So as an investor, what should we be looking at? As an investor, what you want to do is look at the prospects for return on capital. And uh, we would expect that there'll be a lot of investment spending through government programs like the Inflation Reduction Act, but the CHIPS Act, investment spending that's done by the energy sector, the alternative energy sector, the electric vehicle sector, the utility space, uh, semiconductors. But the question that investors have is what's the return on investment going to be? And certain industries have a history of producing uh, poor returns on investment, uh, energy, auto, uh, and, I, and, and others have, have done better or at least are regulated like utilities. So we do expect a lot of investment spending to come in this space. We have yet to really figure out, will this be good for investors and what type of, type of return on investment we will get? I'm sorry, I'll ask you the most basic question. When it comes to the green energy area that now is going to get some subsidy from the U.S. government, is that inflationary or deflationary? Depends on, you know, how if, if it brings down total energy prices, that would be obviously um, 
not inflationary, right? Um, in the meantime, if you say that it's creating, by some accounts, 9 million new jobs over time, of course, over a long period of time, you could say that that could uh, have an impact on people having a you know, larger uh, ability to, to spend and consume. But I think that's much longer term. I think in the short run, if it starts bringing down the cost, overall cost of energy, that is good in terms of our worries about inflation. David Bianco of DWS Group. Thank you so much, David, for being back with us. Afsani Beshlas is going to be staying with us as we turn to a subject she knows particularly well. That's the World Economic Forum over in Davos, and they're holding it next week. We're going to look at how it may be a bit different this year. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Wall Street Week. I'm David West, and the World Economic Forum will hold its annual meeting in Davos, Switzerland next week. It's the first time in the winter since the pandemic, and Afsani Beshlas of Rock Creek has been to her own fair share of these gatherings over the years, I think it's fair to say, and she stayed with us to give us a preview. So, Afsani, how will this one, do you think, be different from what we've seen before? Uh, so, David, I, I, you're absolutely right. I've been going um, since the 1990s in the past, and, um, and I think what's happening this time is um, you have the usual cast of characters. You, I think, uh, more than 50 heads of states, more than 300 uh, ministers or you know government officials, more than 600 uh, CEOs of different uh, companies. What is different is that sort of spirit of cooperation that it is supposed to bring about um, is under question, right? Uh, there's a lot of geopolitical strife going on as we speak. Uh, the Chinese, who did not go into the last uh, few meetings uh, in terms of the, the meetings that were not in person uh, or the first one that was in person in the spring, uh, I think with maybe one person will have, obviously, now that uh, they have the COVID reopening, they ha will have more people, but not too many. Um, seems to be more people from the Middle East and from Asia going, so uh, the composition is changing, less people in uh, Europe, uh, from Europe and the uh, U.S., as you had said earlier. And Russia is not invited. So, you know, it's hard to have conversations around uh, difficult subjects when some people are not are going to be around the table. The yeah. big, big topic, David, I think is going to be, you know, the one criticism of, uh, of uh, Davos and the World Economic Forum, but also other meetings like that, uh, such as COP27 and others, is uh, people get together and there are a lot of lofty statements that are made by governments, by corporations. And, um, you know, some would argue that uh, there's very little follow-up. And that is really the big uh, big question. Will there will it be different this year? Well, Afsani, that's just exactly what I want to ask you about, because one of the subjects, for example, they say they really want to talk about is inequality, wealth inequality, yes. income inequality, which goodness knows is a problem around the world. And we will have some, if I can call them that, activists who really speak up for the less fortunate, and they will talk truth to power. And truth will and power will listen very politely. But will they hear? Will anything come of it? And I think, David, uh, one of the issues is that you have the people who are in the building and the activists who are generally outside the building. Maybe they come for one or two sessions in the building, as it were. So you don't really have enough um, of a dialogue. And I think that's one of the things that uh, the World Economic Forum has tried to change. And it's difficult. Uh, and it's probably something that it needs to spend more time on. But in terms of sort of inequality, the fact that inequality is bigger is a very big problem. The interesting thing is that, for example, uh, in the past, multilateral institutions have come together and talked about how to work together on big problems, such as, for example, right now you're facing huge debt problems in the lowest income countries. But it sounds like that won't happen at uh, this meeting. And countries like in sub-Saharan Africa, who are going to have the lowest uh, growth rate, according to the World Bank, in a very long time, are not necessarily going to be on the agenda. Let me ask you, Afsani, because one of the really themes of the WEF over years has been globalization. Does globalization help or hurt when it comes to inequality? Because I can see it either way. 
Yeah, I mean, as economists, we um, we were taught about you know the theory of uh, globalization being a good thing. I think globalization. There's you know these big words, whether it's globalization or deglobalization, mean so many different things. It really depends because right now we're saying that we are deglobalizing, but in practice we're changing the ways we are trading. Right? It's not going in the direction of trade, like you know, huge amount of trade going from China into other countries. You're starting to talk about whether it is nearshoring or French shoring, that is still trade. That's still people trading with each other. So I think if we look in five years, it may not be the same trend of trade as we saw before, but uh, the globe has come together and people are going to need each other. And uh, we're seeing, for example, a Korean company coming to invest in Georgia in a solar, a huge solar power plant for 2.5 billion. So that is part of globalization, really. Briefly here at the end, Afsani, is international trade and globalization consistent with populism? It certainly has created the problem, David, of uh, of moving jobs uh, to certain places. Again, you know, China was the big beneficiary, right. and bringing wages down, often to a level that is not a living wage, and that certainly has created populism. And that's why you're not seeing, for example, you go to Germany, right. and the German right. government has reduced uh, energy costs yeah. Yeah. by 80 yeah. percent uh, for people, for 80 percent of yeah. energy for people, so that. Yeah. Um, the poor are not as impacted by these high energy that, prices. That living wage will be discussed at Davos. Thank you so much, Chef Sonny Vessels of Rock Creek. Wall Street Week will be in Davos next week with interviews for Bloomberg every day of the week, in addition to a special Davos version of our Friday program. Coming up, fertility rates are declining in the United States and don't appear likely to come back. We'll talk to Melissa Carney of the University of Maryland about why this is and what could it could mean for investors. And this is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. Every year, the Aspen Economic Strategy Group comes out with a monograph describing the state of the economy and, most importantly, what are the big issues that we face. They've just come out with their most recent edition. And we welcome now the director of that group. She is Melissa Carney. She's professor of economics at the University of Maryland. So, Melissa, thank you so much for being back on Wall Street Week. Uh, this is a fascinating report from beginning to end, but particularly I'm interested in the part you authored, which has to do with fertility rates in the United States and what that could do for economic growth. First of all, give us a sense of where we are on utility, fertility rates in the United States and whether this is a temporary thing or it may take care of itself. Sure. So the U.S. fertility rate has plummeted for the past 15 years. And so the problem here is that now we are at a level of fertility in this country that is below replacement level, meaning without immigration, the population um, will not uh, maintain our size. And so what's been happening is for uh, 15 years, annual birth rates have gone down, and now we're at a point where the average number of children born to a woman in the U.S. is substantially below the sort of magic number of 2.1 that would keep us at replacement population level. It's now 1.67. My look at the data suggests that it's unlikely to turn around anytime soon. So what we've really seen is that the decrease in births is very widespread. It's coming from across demographic groups. It's coming across the country. It doesn't seem to be driven by any sort of sharp policy or economic change in the past 15 years. Rather, it seems to reflect more recent cohorts of young adults having fewer children uh, or remaining childless more often than cohorts in the previous past. Um, and so this suggests that there's been a general trend away from having children, from having multiple children. And if we look to other high-income countries that have been right. dealing with this for decades, it's, it's probably going to be stubbornly low. That's my best guess. So, Professor, here on Wall Street Week, we speak to investors in particular. What are the possible consequences of that in terms of economic growth? Because, really, we have to depend upon future economic growth. What is that decline in fertility likely to do to us? The decline in birth rates 
has meant a decline in population growth. And the most immediate effect of this is likely to be a, sh a shrinking size of the working age population. So the working age population in the U.S. has been stagnant for, for over a decade now. And given the decrease in birth rates we've been experiencing for the past 15 years, in the not too distant future, again, absent an increase in immigration, we're simply going to have fewer people of working age. Now, that, that's consequential, both in a fiscal sense, meaning that it's going to put fiscal pressures on our social, social security system, funding for Medicare, uh, disability insurance. But it also, it also poses economic headwinds in the sense that you have fewer people of working age. And that doesn't necessarily just mean fewer people to produce stuff, uh, lower economic out a lower economic activity overall. More worryingly, it could mean lower GDP per capita or a reduction in, in productivity per person, a reduction in living standards. Which could have profound effects, obviously, on investment, uh, particularly in the United States. So what can we do about it? Can we get uh, that fertility rate back up, or do we have to find a workaround? Yeah, so here's where I think we can draw lessons from um, other high-income countries, Japan, UK, Canada, other countries in, in Europe, including Scandinavian countries, um, that have been dealing with below replacement level fertility for many decades. You know, the first thing I would note is that despite efforts to turn things around, fertility has remained below replacement level in those countries uh, for many decades. A lot of those places have implemented explicitly pro-natalist policies, things like baby bonuses or child tax credits, expanded parental leave, expanded subsidies for child care, all things that should make the cost of having children lower um, or the ability to combine work and kids easier. And yet the evidence from those kinds of incremental policies is that they might lead to some modest increase in birth rates in the short run in particular, perhaps not persistently, but nothing of the size that we would need to really lead to a dramatic reversal of the decline in fertility or the stubbornly low fertility rates um, anytime soon. So, you know, that suggests that it would be hard to turn things around. And again, because it looks like what we're seeing is really just a, a move away from having children or having multiple children as opposed to any sort of temporary response to some to some you know discrete change suggests that it's going to be really hard to turn the fertility rate around. So where does that leave us? Well, the obvious thing is to think about increasing immigration. Now, easier said than done in this country. Congress has been sort of derelict when it comes to immigration reform for far too long now. But given these demographic trends, the imperative for immigration reform for allowing more people to legally enter or stay in the country becomes that much stronger. And, and there's lots of sensible reforms, uh, reform proposals out there, ways we could do this. We could certainly have more of an employment-driven immigration system where, you know, like other countries do, including Canada, where we allow more people in who, who are reasonably uh, likely to contribute right away to our economic productivity. Um, we could also increase per country caps and the number of uh, family members who are allowed to immigrate uh, to the country or stay in the country. Beyond immigration, of course, um, again, these demographic headwinds emphasize the need for policies and conditions that promote innovation and productivity growth. Easier said than done, though recent spending bills in Congress aimed at investments in infrastructure, increases in spending on scientific development. All of those are encouraging. All of those are steps in the right direction. But getting innovation policy right is very hard. Uh, and, it's, and it's about, it will require a lot more than just spending. Um, it requires having the conditions in place for competitive uh, companies um, and innovators to flourish and thrive. This is something that we take up in our in our report that you mentioned. Right. Um, and of course, it, it will require a lot of investment in talent, not just importing global talent through more immigration, but also really building the talent pool um, among our native 
foreign population here in the U.S. That report is from the Aspen Economic Strategy Group, and I really highly recommend it. It's fascinating reading. It's really terribly important. Thank you so much for sharing it with us today. That's Melissa Carney. She's professor of economics at the University of Maryland. And we're going to continue this discussion about changes, fundamental changes that will affect the, the plight of CEOs particularly. We're going to talk to Sam Palmisano, the former chairman and CEO of IBM, about how the paradigm has shifted for the average American CEO. That's coming up next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Chief executive officer has a nice ring to it, but it's harder than it looks. You have to respond to forces far outside your control, like, say, the weather, at least if you run an airline like Southwest. We're doing everything we can to return to a normal operation. And please also hear that I'm truly sorry. And pretty much every CEO is subject to the whims of the economy overall, particularly if you're serving consumers like Pure Gym. We're concerned about consumer spending, and hence we've launched memberships which are lower priced, off peak, safer memberships. Uh, and I'm concerned about you know, inflation in, in cost as well for us, of course. On top of the usual, in recent years, CEOs have had to deal with the vagaries of a President Trump declaring a trade war with China. We don't negotiate trade deals. Trade deals get negotiated, and we operate our business accordingly. And a once-in-a-century pandemic that brought business to a halt. I was blown away during this pandemic that everything has changed. Here I am in my office, but nobody else is here. Even when things started to come back, a lot of your employees didn't, at least not in person. There's challenges around onboarding employees in an entirely remote way. There's challenges around uh, feedback and, and recognition, promotions, how you organize teams, how you keep them motivated. But now CEOs are facing something they haven't seen for many years. Slowing growth, higher costs, continued inflation, and interest rates that are taking away those days of free money. When I talk to, to business leaders, certainly at the moment, they say that what the headwinds that they're facing now is almost more challenging than it was in the height of the pandemic. So if you're a CEO, you have to come up with a whole new playbook. And if you're an investor, you need to make sure the company you're putting in your portfolio can adjust to a very different business environment. And now we turn to a seasoned CEO who has been in the C-suite, has done the job through good times and bad. He is Sam Palmasano, former head of IBM. So, Sam, great to have you back here with Wall Street Week. Thank you, David. It's good to be with you this morning. Uh, okay, so the CEO always has a challenge or two in front of him or her. Yes. Uh, but right now, uh, things may be turning a little different. We're seeing real inflation for the first time in a very long time. We're seeing increased interest rates. Yes. Give us your perspective of what the CEO today has to do in 2023 that maybe didn't have to do in the past. Well, you're right, David. The conditions have changed dramatically. And I think there's some offsite, some misleading indicators out there because some people actually believe perhaps there's going to be a soft landing. Now, I'm not smart enough to know whether it'll be a soft landing or a recession, but I think the circumstances that the CEO is dealing with are the same regardless of market conditions. And why do I say that? If you, get, gets, you mentioned the points. Uh, macroeconomic slowdown, no doubt about that. Whether it's a recession or not, that's just how you measure things, but it's a slowing environment. Pressure on consuming, consumer spending you know, uh, because of the economic environment, obviously, right? Labor costs, energy costs, material costs, all going up because of inflation. So these are the operational issues that you deal with, throw on top of that supply chain issues associated with decoupling and, and whatever China does or does not do going out into the future. So fundamentally, it's a very complicated equation. And my perspective, if I was still doing the job like we went through in 08, uh, you'd have an alternative plan. You, would, you could say, OK, these are the positive assumptions. That would be perhaps the soft landing case. But let's have another case that says that these factors go on longer than people are forecasting, that inflation continues, slow growth environments continue, let's say, for 18 to 24 months. Then it's a different scenario that you have to plan for. So, Sam, as you suggest, we don't know what's going to happen, so you we have don't. to have more than one plan. Exactly. But take the perhaps downside, a more modest case, which is lower growth. We have had really robust growth, yes. stimulated in part by fiscal and monetary policy, frankly. Lower growth, 
higher costs of capital, higher interest rates. Uh, how is your plan different? What is the different way you look at your job as a CEO? Yeah. Well, you have to do two things, which is at the same time, which sometimes is hard to do because no, none of the current people have had to do it. Some old guys like us have had to do it, right? But mm -hmm. which you have to go do what's necessary to maintain strategic growth and drive productivity at the same time. You have to be very ambidextrous. Why is that complicated? Because if you were running a strategy was growth, 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 and you were rewarded for that in the past decade, quite honestly, because of low interest rates or free money, et cetera, and markets rewarded you, you have a culture in the management system in your company that says it's all about top line growth. That's changed. And so now you have to drive cash flow, margin expansion, all the old things we used to have to do. That now comes into play because you have to do both. You have to get whatever revenue you can get in this environment. And you can't be, you don't be diluted by the growth because of inflation. I mean, real organic revenue growth, and then adjust your cost structures to maintain profitability and cash flows in that period. As in everything, there are going to be some people better at this and some people worse at this. Uh, yes. On Wall Street Week, we're trying to speak to the C-suite, but also to the investors yes. in the companies. And if you're an investor and you're looking around, how do you determine which CEOs are more likely to be able to deal with this new world that you describe? Well, I think if I'm an investor, I mean, I look at it quite honestly as they have their calls, their earnings calls are coming out, and you'll hear them talk about what they're doing as far as driving the strategies on revenue as well as productivity. And if they're uh, balancing those two in those discussions, then you, have, you kind of make a bet on whether you believe they can execute that or not, right? That's a track record. But I mean, I'm an investor today more than I am a CEO, as you know, either in startups or, or market, uh, I'm, I mean, market conditions and those sorts of things. But I'm looking at the experience of the management team as to where we reallocate our uh, portfolios on their ability to do these things. Uh, some. I think have the ability or the experience to do that and others are have to learn so I would I would factor that into my decisions and I therefore advice I give to an investor you have to size up the management team in the past it was always about the business model their segment the growth the revenue uh, at the foregoing issues around cash flow and balance sheet and those kinds of things. Go out and do a big deal when I say those things that's I think that is over you're not going to be rewarded for go do a big deal the devaluations were off the chart on, it's hard to say whether you ever get those returns that were in your models uh, versus the world we find ourselves in today. That's reallocating portfolios. What about allocating capital as a CEO? Uh, because right. one of the challenges, and certainly I've seen, is it's easy to cut costs across the board, and that's almost always wrong. Wrong, yes. Always. 100% of the time. <laughs> so how do you make those decisions about what are the long-term strategic investments you have to keep making as opposed to where we can afford to cut back? Well, let's start with the top line, for example. I mean, you're, you're going to have strategic investments that you've allocated capital to in the top line. If those cases are still valid and given the circumstances of change, you have to continue those investments because you're investing for multi-year periods of time. So you just, you can't really, you can maybe adjust them, but you can't really, you should not, I should say, stop them. I mean, every, doubt, every downturn in IBM, we took up R&D because mm -hmm. we had the balance sheet to do so, and we believed that we could stay ahead of the competition if we accelerated the R&D. Uh, the other side of this thing, though, is just um, capital allocation around productivity. Mm -hmm. There's so many technology tools out there that you can allocate to to get more pr productivity in the workforce that you should invest in. Having said that, we've all learned, and all the CEOs, my colleagues would say the same thing, there are lots of things that are going on in the company itself that you could put at a very low capital allocation priority. I mean, you can kill them. Sometimes you should, you should just kill them, quite honestly, because they really aren't making a big difference. But if, if for some reason you want to keep them going, but really give them marginal kind of investment uh, just to kind of stay the course, let's say. But I would start with strategic revenue, uh, I, 08, we announced Smarter Plan. We had a billion dollars in this thing called Smarter Plan, and that's to tell you an IBM story. That's the top line thing. And then productivity, at the same time, we drove three or four billion of productivity by using digital technology to globalize the back office of IBM. You mentioned technology a couple of times there. Let's have finished here okay, on right. specifically the challenges for a tech CEO right now. The bloom sort of came off the rose on big tech and investments actually in 2022. What are the challenges faced by a tech CEO and particularly how big a factor does China play in that? Because it's not clear to me at least what President Xi's policy toward tech is right now. Uh, you, you hit the nail on the head. So what is his policy? I mean, it's that stuff back and say China is the largest or second largest 
te technology market in the world. I mean, you can measure it different ways. You can say U.S. is number one, but they're very, very close. When I was working, U.S. was a little bit ahead, but they're very, very close. There's a massive market, and you have no one can forecast. I don't believe with confidence can predict Xi Jinping's uh, strategy when it comes to tech. Uh, he's just, he seems to be moderating versus he was very aggressive for the past couple of years. But if you're a CEO uh, in tech, and you're looking at this opportunity for the technology as well as, the, as well as growth in the marketplace itself, there's no consistency in the policy. So it's, a, it's, it's, it's hard. I mean, it's hard to discern what you should do. Uh, my advice would be is, quite honestly, uh, if you can, don't get in the middle of these arguments. If mm -hmm. you can, you know, I mean, and by that I mean uh, government officials will try to drag you into the debate to help their side of the case. One side or the other isn't the point. You never, I say, you never want to be in the middle of two guerrillas that are fighting. You, you just can't win that. You can't win in that fight. So if you can stay out of that, try to stay out of the fight. I would have a contingency plan, I mean, guys I'm working with today, as to how they start with supply chains. How do you de-risk your supply chain? Because you really don't know what's going to happen. Semiconductors are a big issue in the tech industry. You need to de-risk that. You hear them talking about moving their supply chains out of mainland China, and I think that's prudent to do that. Sam, it's always great to have you on Wall Street. We thank you so much for being here. That's Sam Palmasano. He is former chairman and CEO of IBM. Coming up, we'll wrap up the week with our special contributor, Larry Summers of Harvard. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David West, and we're joined once again by our very special contributor, Larry Summers of Harvard. So, Larry, great to have you back with us. And there's a lot of good news this week, I must say. Reopening of China. We've got a warmer winter than expected in Europe. Maybe not a recession over there. In the United States, inflation numbers are coming down. Are you rethinking some of what you said in the past about the likelihood of recession? I think it is uh, good news. And the evidence that there's been some wage restraint is part of uh, the good part of the part of the good news, but at the same time, I think one has to be careful of uh, false dawns. And if you think about it, the good news was inflation running in the sixes, and that's still inconceivably high by the standards of two or three years ago. So I would stick with my view that a recession this year is more likely uh, than not, but certainly. Looking at some of these trends, one has to think that uh, the Fed's job is much, much closer to being done, feels much, much closer to being done in terms of disinflation than it did uh, a few months ago. And I think the more optimistic possibilities, while they still would not be my bet, look more plausible today uh, than they did several months ago. And that's uh, got to be encouraging. We'll have to be watching the data very, very closely. And the most important day of this month, by far, from a macroeconomic point of view, will be the last day of the month when the Employment Cost Index uh, comes out. That's the gold standard measure of labor costs and wage pressure. And that's a number they'll be studying very, very closely at the Fed and, I suspect, on Wall Street. And I'll certainly be up early that morning uh, to get that number. So right after that, actually, early in February, we're going to have the meeting of the Federal Reserve. Uh, given where we are right now, and it's always data dependent, should they at least be talking about a pause, if not in February, coming after that? I think we're still not quite at uh, that point. Uh, I don't think a pause in February would be uh, well advised, and I don't think we have to make a definite decision uh, Beyond, that, beyond February uh, for uh, right now. Again, I think the most important thing is to make sure that the job of containing inflation uh, gets uh, done and that they preserve uh, their uh, credibility. So I think it's a little bit premature at uh, this point to be thinking about pausing but we're getting much closer to that day. 
Larry, another big story this week had to deal with air traffic in the United States as we had to ground all the airplanes because of an apparent problem with the FAA system. This is something you've referred to in the past, actually, some doubts about the system. Does this raise larger questions about the systems we have in the government, at the FAA and perhaps other places as well, like the IRS, and the need for investment? Look, I think it refers to two things, David. I think it refers to the quantity of resources that we invest, and it refers to the competence uh, with which we invest. Something is wrong when tens of millions of returns sit opened at the IRS. Something is wrong when the IRS opens the phone, answers the phone less than a fifth of the time. Something is wrong when these kinds of fiascos happen with our air traffic control system. Some of this is we just don't invest the resources that we need. Look, I'm not enough of an expert to exactly be able to compare the information technology challenges that an institution like the IRS receiving billions of forms uh, each year has with the information technology faced by a large bank like J.P. Morgan. But it feels very wrong to me that the IRS's IT budget is only 3.5% of that of uh, J.P. Morgan. But at the same time and equally, this is about the competence of the investment uh, process. Some of it goes to punitive regulation, which causes excessive delays and makes even the simplest projects uh, drag on forever. So, Larry, it's, it's a matter of money and competence. On the money front, where are we going to find that money? Because right now there's a lot of concern with the deficit. You have some members of Congress on the Republican side saying we should walk up to and maybe over the precipice of a, of a default. A, d a default would be a catastrophe. It would mean higher borrowing costs forever. It would cost the country billions of dollars uh, to no uh, important benefit. Uh, of all the economic debates in Washington, the debt limit debates are the dumbest uh, ones, since there's no question where they're going to end. If I've got a problem with how one of my kids have spent uh, money, that's something my family and I have to uh, work out. But we don't think that defaulting to Visa is an option for working through the situation. But look, I think the issues of debt accumulation are going to come back onto uh, the national horizon. Uh, my view is, in light of everything that's happening, we are going to have to very substantially increase our national security expenditures in uh, the years ahead, both hard power issues like uh, direct military uh, spending, ammunition and the like, and soft power uh, national security issues like uh, climate change. Larry, China was back in the news this week once again. Uh, the new Congress, one of the first things they did was almost unanimously agree there should be a select committee to investigate so-called threats from China. At the same time, President Biden uh, met with the Prime Minister of Japan to put some more pressure on him about semiconductor technology and China. We're about to have Global Wall Street meet over in Davos, Switzerland. What is the situation with respect to globalization, particularly with respect to China, but more broadly? Look, uh, that'll be very much in the air. On China, in Davos, and when we're both there, David, I'll look forward to discussing it with you on uh, on on Bloomberg. I, I do think that we need an approach other than an approach that's about suppressing the Chinese economy and tearing China down. We need to focus on building ourselves uh, up as our central route to prosperity and our central route uh, to uh, security. Of course, there are certain technologies that we shouldn't be sharing, but as uh, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan has said, our approach uh, should be small garden, high walls in defining what that set of technologies are. But the most important thing is doing everything we can to make sure that we are always pushing uh, the envelope and uh, moving uh, forward. I think we also need to uh, emphasize 
uh, and the Biden administration has done that. Uh, Larry, we had word this week that Microsoft is at least contemplating substantially increasing its investment in open AI, which is, of course, where we got chat GPT from, something you brought to Wall Street Week a while ago now. I know you've been following this closely. Where are we with things like chat GPT and other forms of AI? You know, what, what one hears from the experts is that uh, there are proprietary systems inside some of the major companies that are even a generation past uh, ChatGPT. So I think this is coming at us very hard and is going to touch almost every aspect of life. Certainly for those of us in education, uh, the ability of machines to write uh, essays is raising all kinds of questions about what constitutes a student's own uh, work. On the other hand, those are tools that are going to enable us to figure things out and make progress on problems much faster uh, than we did before. So this is an area where all the various stakeholders need to be thinking uh, very, 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 very hard. There's enormous potential in this, but as with other innovations like the Internet, like uh, the steam engine, there are potential implications, both uh, good and bad, and I think it needs very much to rise in terms of how prominent it is in our national discussions. Larry, thank you so much for being back with us. That is our very special contributor here at Wall Street Week. He's Larry Summers of Harvard. Coming up, prominent former world leaders proving once again that living well is the best revenge. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Finally, one more thought. If at first you don't succeed, well, just go make some real money. History is full of tales of those who tried nobly and failed. Icarus with his waxed wings, the Christians with, well, just about every one of their crusades, and even the ultimate man in the arena himself, Teddy Roosevelt. Even he failed in his final run for president. But history also has quite a few examples of those who had to regroup but came back stronger than ever. Of course, there's the famous tale of Steve Jobs, driven from the apple that he had created, wandering around in the wilderness, only to be brought back and take it to heights no one could have imagined. I don't think one ever bets against uh, Apple. I don't think you bet against, you know, the talent of that, that company. And our very own Sam Palmisano, a contributor to Wall Street Week. He started as an offensive center at Johns Hopkins, but when faced with the opportunity to play pro ball for the Oakland Raiders, he walked away to pursue sales. And of course, he ended up chairman and CEO of IBM. But maybe there's no place like politics for second acts, as Richard Nixon showed the world after losing to John F. Kennedy and ending up as president after all. Having lost a close one eight years ago and having won a close one this year, I can say this. Winning's a lot more fun. <laughs> Even some of those who may not come back to public life are doing quite nice financially. This week, we learned about the fortunes of former British Prime Minister Theresa May. She lost her job and seemed pretty discouraged at the time. I will shortly leave the job that it has been the honor of my life to hold. I do so with no ill will, but with enormous and enduring gratitude to have had the opportunity to serve the country I love. But Ms. May can take heart. Since then, she has made a cool $3 million from outside appearances, more than any other member of parliament. And then, of course, there's the man who bills himself as the greatest businessman of them all, former President Donald Trump, who lost his bid for re-election two years ago, but has come back with a whole new way to make money. I'm doing my first official Donald J. Trump NFT collection right here and right now. They're called Trump Digital Trading Cards. Each card comes with an automatic chance to win amazing prizes like dinner with me. I don't know if that's an amazing prize, but it's what we have. And for those who might have scoffed, the former president cleared nearly $4.5 million in a matter of just a few hours as his 45,000 cards went for $99 each and rapidly climbed into the thousands in the aftermarket, with Mr. Trump getting a commission on every trade made. 
So if you ever worry about stumbles along your way, rest assured that there may be a bigger pot of gold still at the end of your rainbow. That does it for this episode of Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This is Bloomberg. See you next week.